Hi, everybody. This is Nick Gillespie with Reason. I am joined by Zach Weismuller, my colleague at Reason. Zach. Hi. And today's guest is Vinay Prasad. He is a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at University of California, San Francisco. He's the author of two books, including one on ending medical reversal or getting rid of bad medical practices and malignant and he has been an outspoken critic of the public health establishment uh, during the COVID period. Uh, Vinay, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me. Uh, you, let's get right to it. You have a, a, a very popular and urgent substack, uh, really, Vinay Prasad's observations and thoughts. Uh, one recent um, uh, article that we wanted to talk with you about, uh, because it opens up the, the conversation we're hoping to have today about what went wrong with the official COVID response? What went right with it? But most importantly, how do we make sure we don't screw it up the next time when something like this happens and we build on our successes rather than replicating our failures endlessly? But this is from February 17th and it's headlined, Public Health Should Lose Your Trust. Can you kind of summarize the argument there? Yeah, I think this, this is an, uh, an article that, that sort of makes the argument that we should trust institutions insofar as their past performance. And unfortunately, public health, by that I mean the institutions of public health, the CDC, the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIAID, which Tony Fauci ran, um, and even some local public health officials should lose your trust because of their poor performance. And I go on to detail you know, seven domains where I think we can all agree they really underperformed and maybe even, in fact, told us some falsehoods along the way. I'm happy to run through those. Yeah. Well, why don't we, um, Zach, do you want to start with like what you you find most pressing? But, uh, you know, one of the questions, I guess, that we'll come back to again and again, Vinay, is how much of this is that public health authority <laughs> didn't have good information and they weren't willing to cop to that? So they were, you know, they thought it would be too complicated for people to understand, well, you know what, uh, you know, masks don't work, or they, they would give an issue, you know, an order early on, or, or they would talk about how don't bother about wearing masks because they're not really important. And then somebody like Fauci a little bit later says, well, I was misrepresenting what I thought to be true because I didn't think people could understand. How much of it is official dissembling and how much of it is kind of government or, or public health authorities not being able to cop to the fact that they don't really know what to do and they're giving you their best case scenario at this point in time. Well, I mean, let's just run through that example. So Fauci, early March 2020, he says, you know, on 60 Minutes, very prominently, um, we don't advise community masking. We don't know if you might be touching your face and have some compensatory behavior that sort of undoes any benefit masking might have. Six weeks later, he goes and says, you know what, I was, I was telling you something false initially. It was a noble lie. I'm telling you the truth now, which is that you ought to cloth mask, tear a piece of fabric and put it over your nose and mouth. The irony is actually it was the second time that he was lying. It was the first time he was telling the truth. You know, the first time he was going with the pre-pandemic body of knowledge, he was going with multiple randomized trials from influenza. The second time under sort of a heavy pressure campaign from I think advocates that we ought to do something, he started to recommend a mask that now we know clearly cloth masks, I don't think anyone debates, they don't work and they didn't do anything. We have a Cochrane review that just came out that says any community mask recommendation doesn't appear to work in all of the pooled studies. And that's the highest quality evidence we have to date. So your question is, you know, did he know he was lying the second time? I suspect he did actually. Yeah. And why was he doing it? Well, one reason is if you go and say, well, you know, I'm not sure, but we've shifted. We think maybe give it a shot. Yeah. People may not really comply. So you have to really sell it. The problem with that, I think, is that we live in a free society where you don't get to deceive the American public because it is a democracy. We should be presenting you know, fair and balanced information so people can make the right choices. The second thing that's a problem is you only get to lie once. I mean, you lose all credibility. And he has become a polarizing figure. He thinks that's because there's some conspiracy against him, but to some degree, it's the result of his own actions. Can I ask to, to follow up and to balance Fauci, say, with Donald Trump, who, you know, who convened a panel of experts, including Fauci, that, you know, were having daily press conferences. Was it problematic that Donald Trump uh, at the beginning of the pandemic was saying, hey, this isn't a big deal. This is going to be over by Easter. Don't worry about it too much, et cetera. 
And and was Trump, do you think Trump was acting out of noble lies or was he acting out of, you know, he just he couldn't admit that he didn't really know what was going on? I think uh, whole textbooks could be written trying to understand what makes Donald Trump yeah. tick. And I think he's a harder person to sort of interpret. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think he may have genuinely believed that the pandemic would blow over. I mean, he was wrong. He certainly to, wanted it to blow he over. He wanted it to be the case, yeah. right. He was wrong to believe that. I don't think yeah. science would suggest that that would be the case. In fact, everyone was saying that this is going to be a long and year-long and yeah. multi-year-long problem. Um, but I think we have to acknowledge one thing, which is that he is such and is such, was such a polarizing figure. It was such an anxious time that many people really anchored into doing whatever the opposite he said. So if Trump right. says schools are safe, they got to be dangerous. If Trump says right. you don't need to wear a mask, it's got to work super well. And I fear that to this day, so much of our pandemic legacy is merely doing the opposite of what he says. But you know, even a broken watch is right twice a day. And some things he was right about, schools he was right about, masks yeah. he was right about. The topic that is still kind of a live topic at this point, because masks, thankfully, are, are mostly uh, in the rear view right now, but um, yeah. vaccines are still an active issue. And um, it's there's become a lot of conf over time. There's been a lot of confusing messages about it. There's kind of the, the data is confusing for the lay person. And I, I, to get into that conversation, I'd like to just play you some of the a montage of clips of the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, talking about vaccines over time and get your reaction to that, uh, you know, in, in the context of what you were just talking about, um, the, the proper way to communicate publicly and, and the way that if you're constantly, you know, uh, backtracking or fudging things, then uh, it can kind of bounce back on you. But um, here's Rochelle Walensky. Is that if you're fully vaccinated, you are protected against severe COVID hospitalization and death and are even protected against the known variants, including the Delta variant circulating in this country. Just last month, the CDC and the FDA both said we would not need booster shots. What specifically has changed in the data that has changed your guidance? Right, several things. So first, um, in the last six weeks, we have seen Delta in this country. We have seen now evidence that we've been looking at just over the last <laughs> week or so that has demonstrated that the vaccine is starting to wane in its effectiveness against infection. I, I don't want to say never, but um, we are not necessarily anticipating that you will need this annually. Um, it does look like after this third dose, you get a really robust response. And so we will continue to follow the science. A new vaccine with a new approach. For most Americans, that means one COVID-19 shot once a year each fall. We are simplifying our message. The message is um, you need to get your fall booster vaccine. Um, so go ahead and get it. Um, if, you're, if you're over the age of 12, if you've received your primary series, if you're more than tw two months out of your last shot, you can get an updated vaccine. And so we've intentionally simplified the message so it's very, very clear. What do you think of the job that the CDC and Rochelle Walensky have done as it pertains to the vaccine rollout? I think it's been very poor and deeply troubled. It's the characteristics of a speaker who's decided what she wants the public to do and then reasons back to the sort of messaging that she should deliver rather than somebody looking at the scientific facts and just telling you what we know and what we don't know and what we still uncertain. We can go back to the beginning, the first six months of 2021, as vaccine rollout started to take place. You know, in the first four months, we were supply constrained, meaning not everyone who wanted one could get one right away. We made a number of mistakes around who should be prioritized. We prioritized a lot of young, healthy people over older people. We made mistakes about dose two. The United Kingdom stretched dose two out, which actually provides more durable antibody levels and has better safety than putting the two doses together. Those doses were arbitrarily picked very close together because we needed the trial to result quickly in 2021. By the summer of 2021, it was apparent from Provincetown, Massachusetts and other instances that you would get people who were vaccinated were still able to catch the virus and transmit the virus. That means all the mandates that happened in the fall, which was when Biden pushed the mandates, were medically unethical because you cannot compel an intervention on a third party if it provides, sorry, you cannot compel a medical intervention on somebody unless there is a benefit to third parties. But by the fall of 2021, we knew that that wasn't the case. Now, I wanna point out, 
We could have made Pfizer answer the question. In the randomized trial Pfizer ran in 2020, we could have asked them to swab people randomly and their households randomly, and we would have had an estimate of transmission. But over and over again, you'll see that to some degree, both administrations give the companies the benefit of the doubt, the easiest path forward. Now let's talk about boosters. This country is unique that we have a singular focus on boosting everybody from 12 year olds to six month olds to 86 year olds. Whereas in Europe, a number of nations have focused primarily on older vulnerable people. That makes a lot of sense, the European strategy. Our strategy does not make sense, not supported by evidence. She's being criticized by people like Paul Offit, who he himself makes vaccines. And her rhetoric throughout all this is always too certain and states things that she does not know to be true. I mean, there are video clips of her saying, we know you can't spread the virus. She didn't know that to be true when she said it, and it turned out not to be true. And um, can I ask about that? I mean, yeah. at the beginning, and I uh, we interviewed Jay Bhattacharya a while ago, and one of the things he was saying, which corresponds with what you're talking about, is that the public health authorities at the highest levels oversold the vaccines. Not The vaccines definitely work to reduce the severity of, you know, they, they might reduce transmission. They definitely reduce the severity of the COVID that you get if, if you've been vaccinated. Uh, and that's really important because a lot of people are now just saying like all vaccine, you know, the vaccines don't do anything other than, you know, cause people to go insane or, or, or die. Um, but that they oversold from the beginning the efficacy of the vaccines in terms of stopping transmission, et cetera, because they didn't have faith that people would get the vaccine if they had merely been told, get the vaccine and you won't die from COVID. You might still get it. You might even be hospitalized, but at a much lower rate. Do you think, is was that the, the original problem, that the authorities knew these vaccines are not traditional vaccines and that they keep you from getting something, but they thought that message was too complicated to sell to the American people? That's a tough question. I mean, I, I, I definitely think you're right uh, in the sense that uh, older people do benefit. I mean, the benefit of the vaccine in first quarter 2021 is tremendous for 80 year olds, 70 year olds, 60 year olds. Right. I think one of the challenges is we to this date don't really know what the lower limit of benefit is, how much benefit young people are getting, particularly right. young people who've had COVID. We're not and honest. Even, about even people like 40, right? I mean, I, I, I mean, you're, you're kind of talking about how it's, there's like, it, it, there's a slope that gets pretty quickly. If you're over 60 or whatever, uh, COVID vaccine is much more important than if you're under 40. Yeah. And that's particularly true with boosters. And it's particularly true once you've already had and recovered from the virus, you know, and, and so those are sort of salient points. Um, I think there may have actually genuinely had some optimism that this could halt transmission um, because hope springs eternal among human beings. But things that would have led them to doubt that is that we continually get reinfected with coronavirus. It's evolves in such a way you can get it multiple times in your life. And they, didn't build into the studies the sort of the way you would actually document halting transmission, you know, those sort of random swabbing of people to see that transmission is halted. Now, I want to point out a few things. I think transmission is lowered with COVID-19 vaccines. In the first half of 2021, it was dramatically lowered by vaccination. But escape variants like Omicron basically blast right through vaccines. I mean, you can get infected with Omicron even if you've had the vaccination. We still believe it has a reduction in severe disease, so it's good that you had gotten it, but it has no ability to curtail, curtail spread. And now the idea that each additional booster will do something, I think some people believe like, you know, it's going to prevent variants from forming. That's naive thinking. I mean, there's 8 billion people on the planet, 100 billion interactions. The virus is going to be with us for 10,000 years. And any boosters you give is 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 going to be like spitting in the ocean. It's not going to do anything for viral mutations. Yeah. You designed a study that uh, looks at uh, it's called COVID nineteen vaccine induced myocarditis mm -hmm. in young males. Uh, system systematic review, and we'll get a little bit more into this myocarditis issue in a second because that's current. That seems to be the most salient concern that people have with with the, on the safety side of the vaccines. But the, the interesting aspect of this study is it's designed to look only, uh, it's, it's designed to age, well, it's designed to stratify among a, a bunch of different variables. One is age, one is the brand of vaccine you got, or the manufacturer, um, another is which, which type of dose you got. And I, I got to say that this is one thing that's been really baffling to me about the entire pandemic is the lack of stratification in multiple areas, not looking 
at very specific <laughs> subpopulations or vaccine brands. Um, it's like everyone must do the same thing and act as if they're at identical risk. What before we get into the study, like, what do you do? You, do you agree that with me on that? And if, if so, like, what explains that that kind of one size fits all approach that that seems to have uh, covered many areas of the pandemic? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you on the premise. And I think this is the original sin of the pandemic is that people like Jay and Martin who proposed some sort of differential protection, more protection for those who need it, less for those who uh, will have better courses with COVID-19, keep schools open, like the Swedish approach, that sort of focus protection that was demonized in this country. We needed a one size fits all lockdown. And all of our policies since have been one size fits all. The 18 year old man has to have the exact same number of doses as the 88 year old woman. Actually, maybe you right. can have four instead of five, for instance, but almost the same. And yeah. the point of our article was what we're talking about, where's that tipping point trade-off? Um, there is a risk of vaccines. It is myocarditis, inflammation of the heart. It's non-trivial. I mean, people can say it's mostly mild. I think that's a very dishonest thing to say because if you're a healthy person taking a medical product, you don't want to end up hospitalized with inflammation of your heart muscle. I think it's a very severe outcome. And there are some people who have suffered very severe myocarditis episodes. And that's something that we have to minimize and take seriously. It's a serious safety concern. So where is the tipping point um, in terms of risk benefit by age? And I think that was what we were talking about a little bit before. Certainly men are at higher risk than women of myocarditis. Moderna appears to be higher risk than Pfizer, perhaps because the dose is higher. Um, men in a certain age group, you know, the 16 to 24 demographic. Yeah, you see here, uh, they're at the absolute highest risk of myocarditis. Uh, old, an 80-year-old woman is at a very low risk of myocarditis. For her, the net benefit of a vaccine is large. But when you talk about a 20-year-old college man, what's the risk-benefit balance of dose one, dose two, dose three, and dose four? And does it change? Because each additional dose is not providing as much benefit as the first dose. And I think very likely it does change along the way for a young man. And our policy is actually detrimental for young men to keep getting perpetual boosters. That's not just my opinion. That's the opinion of Jay and Martin, Marty Macri and many others. And we published a peer review article on this. Um, so I think to your point is well taken. Medicine has always treated 20 year old men different than 80 year old women. We don't right. take the same blood pressure pills and we don't take the same statins. We need different vaccine policies as well. It's, it's amazing, too, when you look at the CDC data right. or, you know, official data on the number of deaths from COVID or with COVID or however you want to measure it. And when you're looking under 18, I mean, it's still, I think, under a thousand for the United States out of, you know, over a million deaths attributed to COVID. What, I mean, is it, is it, I guess we go back to this question again and again, and if we could ask them, we would, but I mean, is it that people like Fauci and, uh, or uh, Rochelle Walensky and whatnot, <clears throat> is it that they don't understand what you just said and that like this affects people under 21 differently or under 20 that it does people over 60, or is it that they don't care and they don't think that any of us are smart enough to be like, well, if I'm over 60, I probably should get the vaccine. If I'm under 20, I can wait, or, or I have to weigh in more factors. Yeah, this is why I wrote the article, they should lose your trust, because if they really yeah. don't understand that, then they're grossly incompetent for the job, because this right. is a basic medical fact, you know, that, that risk will vary you know, thousandfold by age and that the risk benefit calculus of a vaccine with the harm may tip. And if they do understand it, but they nonetheless try to have force a one size fits all message, they should lose your trust because they're being dishonest to you. And, you know, you can fool some people for some of the time, but you can't fool everyone forever. And eventually more and more people are going to come out and pointing to these errors. And that's going to lead to a bigger problem, which is a cataclysmic loss of trust in public health. So I do think they've made a, a, a huge miscalculation. And just make proof of that, you have the resignation of Marion Gruber and Phil Krause. This is the director and deputy director of vaccine products at FDA, posts they held for decades. They have resigned over this administration's booster policy in the fall of 2021. That should signal to people that this is heavily disputed among experts. These are the vaccine experts of the FDA. They're being steamrolled into a one-size-fits-all policy. And I just want to point out who benefits from that policy. The company benefits a great deal yeah. because it's a huge perpetual market share. And who's hurt by that policy? Well, I think that 20-year-old man who attends a liberal arts school who's being forced to get a booster and one in 10,000, maybe one in 20,000 will get vaccine-induced myocarditis. And that person may have already had COVID 
and stands to gain nothing from that additional booster. So that man is harmed. I want to uh, contrast what the official line or advice is about the vaccines with what you are saying, because what it more or less is, and I'm going to play the clip of uh, Rochelle Walensky in a second talking about myocarditis and, and display <clears throat> some of the CDC's messages about this, but it's basically like, okay, this is a, my, there's, there's a mild risk, but in the big picture, uh, you know, you can get myocarditis from the infection itself. There's lots of other bad things that can happen from the infection itself. So we need to just simplify the message and say, you're better off getting the booster than not. So let me play this clip from Rochelle Walensky and then um, have you respond to that line of argumentation. Parts of this rare but mild myocarditis come in. Um, and we heard about this yesterday at the um, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices yesterday. Um, but what we do when we do this is we look at the risks and we look at the benefits. And to just put this in perspective, if we have a group of 12 to 17 year olds who are uh, working to vaccinate over the next four months, and we can vaccinate a million of them, which would be great strides, over the next four months, we could expect 30 to 40 of these mild, self limited cases of myocarditis. And for that, if we were to vaccinate all 1 million, we would avert 8,000 cases of COVID, 200 hospitalizations, 50 ICU stays, and one death. And so we weigh the risks as well as the benefits, these extraordinary benefits of vaccines as we make these recommendations. And it is why we at CDC have made the recommendations to vaccinate and had co-signers from so many other medical organizations, including the American Heart Association. So that on its face, that argument makes sense. Is there something wrong with her math? Yes, that's exactly right. So, I mean, her premise is correct that every time you take any medical product, you got to weigh the potential upside against the potential downside. And even if there's downside, if there's more upside, it's still in your best interest to take it. So we all agree on that premise. But the problem is there are errors in her math. Uh, all of their math is nothing but errors. Uh, a few things they conceptually get wrong. One is that you don't have to give it, in, in their modeling. A lot of the times it's all or nothing. It's either four boosters or no shots at all. I personally think that the vast majority of adults benefit from dose one. Dose two is when I start to struggle with from 20 year old men and dose three and dose four, you know, I have different cut points, you know, so it can vary by dose depending on your modeling. Number two, we only really know with sort of good precision, the reduction in severe disease in the first two doses. That's what we tested in a randomized fashion for boosters. And for the fourth, the bivalent booster, we're doing sort of retrospective looks. In other words, we, we don't actually run an experiment to see what the efficacy is. We just let people get it. And we go after the fact and say, hey, let's compare people who got it to people who didn't get it and see how they do. Okay, and let me bring problem. up like this this slide <laughs> yes. real quick because I know that you good. you analyzed this. Part. This is a CDC mm -hmm. slide, uh, and it's to the point that you're say, you're talking about. They're saying that per million doses of the, this is of the bivalent booster uh, in 12 to 17 year olds over six months. Mm -hmm. the, there's the numbers of hospitalizations, ICU admissions prevented, one zero to one death pre prevented, and then in red at the bottom, zero myocarditis cases. So that's the message coming from the CDC, but you're saying that these studies are just, they're garbage. They're not designed properly. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a model. It's based on like all the models we've had in the pandemic that, <clears throat> you know, wildly inaccurate oftentimes it's based on your assumptions. And so what they're assuming is rate hospitalization from the past that are going to go forward into the future unchanged. But of course mm -hmm. that's going to be different because more people have had and recovered from COVID. So that's going to be lower. What they assume is a vaccine effectiveness so that this bivalent booster will lower your risk of severe disease that they're actually getting from an older age group and extrapolating to a younger age group. They're getting it from this sort of backwards looking kind of study that has a bias in it. And that bias, of course, you know, Zach and Nick, the bias is that people who choose to get the booster are different than those who don't in other ways than the booster. I mean, they're usually more precautious people. They're people who may have higher socioeconomic status. They may more likely to be liberals who live in certain cities, you know, for mm. instance. And those other differences might play the role, not the bivalent booster itself. So you have a sort of dubious estimate of hospitalization, dubious estimate of vaccine efficacy, extrapolating to a younger age group. And then let's talk about the harm side of the ledger. She says zero harms out of the 48,000 doses, 
but they can't actually believe the harm will really be zero. It will be something when you give it to more people and allow more time for follow-up. My best guess as to what that something will be is one in 10,000, because that's a very nice estimate from the third dose in, in, in roughly this age group um, from the Kaiser Permanente group. So again, you know, these types of exercises modeling in, in science, it's the most malleable science. You can bend and flex it. And I can make my own analysis that would probably reach a different tipping point than hers. The problem is that the person doing this modeling has a already decided on the policy. They've already mm -hmm. decided that these vaccines have to be given to this age group, and then they do the modeling. And that's very problematic because if we know where we want to go, we can get the model to give us the result. Is there any world <laughs> where this, you know, in an alternate universe, how would this have been accomplished? How would quality studies have been accomplished? Because you, you, you do understand, like I can understand from their perspective, we're in an emergency situation. It's a pandemic. People are dying, getting hospitalized all the time. So we don't have time to do these high quality randomized control trials might be the argument. Is there anything to that? And you, you just kind of have to deal with the uncertainty. Yeah. So I think it's a perpetual argument. And there's always two things. They say we don't have the money and we don't have the time. The right. money, I think we'll all concede they have because Pfizer and Moderna yeah. have 100 billion reasons they can make this happen. Right. The time right. is the question. How long do these studies take? And my answer is the following simple thing. They debuted this bivalent booster in the fall, I believe in September. And we still have 14 percent uptake nationally in age groups. So, you know, what's the point of rushing something that nobody wants anyway? The next thing I'd say is that randomized studies actually don't take as much time as you think. Just think about the initial vaccine trial, which was launched sort of in the summer of 2020 and yielded a result by the fall. Um, if you increase the number of people you give it to, you'll get a result even faster. I think it's inexcusable that they don't, do, they don't make the company do those studies. The company is going to make money for you know, year after year, billions of dollars. Um, they can afford to do it. We can have the infrastructure to do it. And by doing those studies, I think you will learn the reality. And my guess is the reality is that the the, the benefit of these products year after year after year is going to be smaller than what they think it is. Can we talk a little bit about the relationship between the pharmaceutical companies and the, and the government and the policy? Because you've written that, you know, one of the great successes of the COVID pandemic, uh, which has been really obscured, is the fact that the, uh, the disease was sequenced very quickly and we brought effective vaccines to market incredibly quickly, to, you know, shots into arms. Um, but that seems to be, um, you know, very uh, one of the reasons why that's kind of obscured or, or it moves to the back um, is because of the conditions that were attached to the development and the follow up of the problems. Could you could you talk a little bit about what went right with Operation Warp Speed and then where, you know, you, you've mentioned a couple of times that Pfizer and Moderna and other vaccine makers aren't, aren't required to do continuing kind of studies and things like that. But, you know, talk about what went right and then why it's, you know, the follow through is not where it should be, according to you. Yeah. And um, I guess I just want to say that what we're getting at is sort of an age old principle of medicine, which is we have interventions that work really well in very sick people that sometimes the manufacturers, of course, their interest is to just use it in more people. And as you get to people who are less and less sick, they work less and less well. And at some point, the harms outweigh the benefits. We see that with, you know, stenting heart attacks works wonderfully. Mm -hmm. Stenting people with just a touch of angina, you know, might not work well at all. Mm -hmm. And that's the age old principle of medicine. So let's talk about Operation Warp Speed. I think it was, you know, remarkable success. They really expedited the development of the mRNA vaccine in a time frame that even the optimists thought was implausible. Yeah. And there's no doubt about yeah, it. I mean, people at the time, and it, it, it's weird because it's not long ago, but it feels like a million years ago. But people were talking about, you know, three years, five years yeah. to really get a vaccine that's up and working and things like that. And, you know, there it is in a few months. There it is right around the election. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah. Right well, around. just after. Right. Well, we so, can talk about that because yeah. Pfizer made an yeah. addendum to their trial. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, but it was remarkable that they were able to run the randomized trial in such a short fashion. Operation Warp Speed was a success. They were sort of uh, given money to make sure they wouldn't suffer losses and so that they would take that investment risk. Right. And I have no doubt about it that the vaccine saved many, many lives, including American lives, particularly older, vulnerable people. Now, the questions we're arguing about today is a different question. That was 2020, the fall. We had a Delta wave that led to horrific deaths. 
the vaccine had come out a few weeks sooner, we would have averted some of those deaths. We could talk about that. But right now, we, have a uh, we did at reason. I mean, the, you know, the fact that like the FDA took Thanksgiving weekend off to, you know, pushing things back, even, you know, even by the day, it's, you know, you, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's, no, like, no, you're right. We have two, you know, we have two agencies, particularly the CDC, but also the FDA, they exist for exactly this type of situation. Right. And then they were like, well, you know what? It's quitting time today. We'll see you on Monday. I, it's, it's insane making, to be quite it, honest. But It's insane. And the original Pfizer study was going to have a statistical look at 30 events, and then they moved it to 60 events in an amendment that actually mm -hmm. delayed it until after the election. And these two choices, I detail in that essay you put up, actually significantly delayed vaccine rollout. It could have come out several weeks before. And I think you're right that when it's an emergency, you don't take any days off and you work around the clock. And if we need to reschedule people's shifts, so be it. Um, but now we're in a different situation. I mean, I think we all agree there was a COVID-19 emergency, but does anyone think there's an emergency for healthy 12 to 15 year olds in 2023, February? Mm -hmm. I think I'd be hard pressed to find anyone who can genuinely look you in the eye and tell you there's an emergency. So I think the EUA authority, that emergency use authorization should not be allowed for bivalent boosters in a 12 year old because they're not facing any emergency. We can go back to the traditional pathways uh, of drug development. And I, so I guess the debate about vaccines has been so polarized. They're either, as you yeah. point out, they're going to murder you in your sleep, you know, and, and cause you to have every problem or and, they're uh, a panacea. Things will be stick right. Spoons will be sticking to your head and stuff. Yeah. And or they're a panacea and you should get as many as experts recommend. And if they recommend them every two months, you should get them every two months, even if you're six months old, you know, that, so these are the two extremes of the debate. But the truth about medicine is that all medical interventions work well for some people and some people you can do too much of a good thing and get into trouble. So I think that's the debate. Yeah. What, what do you think went into the, you know, I guess the negotiation is the right phrase for it, but you know, what went into the negotiation between the government uh, and the pharmaceutical companies in terms of saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna immunize you from a bunch of legal liability, which you know, I, I and I say this as a libertarian, I think I understand where that's coming from and it makes sense. That's one thing. And then to say we're also going to we're not gonna force you to do continual, you know, studies on what's working or at to what extent, you know, to what population and things like that. You know, were the government negotiators, are they just completely captured? by the pharmaceutical companies or again, you know, and I guess maybe this is the wrong question to ask because I don't know that we can answer it. Or, you know, were they, you know, are they captured by the regulators or are they just being mendacious and they're actually servants of, of the pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, and they're, they're pretending that they don't know what they should be doing. I think many people have talked about this problem in FDA. I mean, we did an analysis in the BMJ where we looked at where do the reviewers at the FDA go when they leave the FDA? And the answer is more than half uh, go to the pharmaceutical industry. And we saw it with Stephen Hahn. He's at a VC firm that has investments in Moderna. Pa, pa, uh, Gottlieb, Scott Gottlieb, he works on the board of Pfizer. And I suspect you'll see that this cast of characters will soon transition to these same firms whose products they expedited. I think many people view the client as the pharmaceutical company, not the American people, and they view their job to streamline these things. You talked about indemnification. I think indemnification made sense at a time where you were getting frivolous MMR lawsuits for measles, mumps, and rubella all the time. Uh, but does indemnification still make sense when you're getting preschools mandating vaccine boosters in young children so kids can go to a summer camp or a daycare? I personally think I don't, I'm not comfortable with letting some mid-level bureaucrat in an upstate New York summer camp decide what vaccines should be mandated. I think they should be legally liable for any consequences of that mandate, right? Could you also, you you touched on this earlier, and it's a really important point that when, when the vaccine does not actually help a third party, yes, um, there's, <laughs> there's no grounds for a mandate from a public health perspective. Could you just explain that a little bit because that's another dynamic here that i think has gone missing in a lot of these discussions and it's absolutely central to what what is a legitimate kind of public health model and mandate and you know what we've been experiencing yeah so i guess i want to say one thing right off the bat that even if it does affect third parties favorably you should still weigh the risks and benefits of doing it of but if it doesn't affect third parties favorably you can't start you can't pass go and what i mean is medical products that pills you take, vaccines you take, devices you put in your body, they can only be, man like an ethical prerequisite to mandate it 
they can only be considered for mandate is if they provide a benefit to third parties. And that third party benefit has to be so large, it outweighs the loss of individual freedom and autonomy. And this is not a new principle. This has been there for you know, 50, 60 years of medical ethics. And when they did mandate this vaccine, they knew that it could not prevent transmission. So I think they didn't have the ethical prerequisite to mandate it. All the booster mandates, I think, are ethically trouble, troublesome. Uh, it doesn't halt transmission. Some people say, well, it transiently reduces transmission 20%. So therefore, there is a benefit to third parties. That doesn't make a lot of sense because when we're around for two years, we're all going to get COVID anyway. So what is the benefit of potentially delaying it by three weeks or something and, like that? And, you know, for the individual, you can make that decision. You can say this is, I think that, or I believe, or I know this is going to reduce my chance of hospitalization right. and death or whatever. What are, what are the, the best examples of a mandated vaccine or, or public health intervention that has actual, that fits the ethical criteria that you just laid out? Yeah, I mean, I think I would say the, the measles vaccine fits that criteria, and I'll tell you why. Um, it, it does because if the amount of children who are measles vaccinated is above a certain threshold, measles will literally go away. We won't have an outbreak of measles at all. So, but it takes that certain threshold to be hit. And so you can argue that by getting it to that threshold with compulsion, with mandates, we actually benefit a lot of third parties because no kids are getting measles, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's a sterilizing vaccine. Those mandates are often in place in school districts. And I think it fulfills the ethical prerequisite. Mm -hmm. um, this doesn't because you can mandate it all you want and people are still going to get COVID-19. Now, some people argue that actually we should have a new version of mandates that if I think it's in your best interest, I should be able to mandate it on you. The problem I have with that is it's a slippery slope. So I can come to your house and tell you what you should eat and tell right. you to take your blood pressure medicines and actually supervise you swallowing them. And that's something that no one has ever accepted in medicine. And it's something that I think nobody wants. And so we don't do things. I mean, we let people make bad choices. You can drink too much. You can smoke if you want. You can eat poorly. We let people make those bad choices. That's what it means to be in a free society. Um, but we only mandate it if there's a compelling benefit to third parties. The last thing I just want to say on this issue is I think even if it stopped transmission, I wrote editorial saying that in America, in the in the political climate we're in, the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. I mean, mm -hmm. it, 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 the, the political consequences of forcing a very novel product on a huge or on a chunk of American people um, would have long term deleterious implications. And the last thing I want to say is I don't think the mandate actually increased uh, uptake that much. There's a trend in uptake pre mandate. They mandated it and then they take credit for anything post uptake. But you know, it was going to go up anyway. I estimate probably two to three percent of people got it just by virtue of the mandate, and a lot and of people it, got just from the workforce, and that's a hard. Although thing. it is also true that I mean, the uh, in a historical context, the uptake of the COVID vaccine is just off the charts. It took polio vaccines, <clears throat> MMR, et cetera, decades to get to where the COVID uh, vaccine basically got in less than a year. We're the most pro-vax society in any time in human history. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something people miss because we talk so much how anti-vax we are, mm -hmm. but no one has ever uptake a vaccine as quick as this. I do I, think, if I just may, I mean, to go back to Trump a little bit, you know, part of the confusion there, you know, and it's people like Fauci, you know, who's taking a massive amount of abuse, and I think legitimately so, Walensky, uh, whatnot, um, you know, but Trump, it, it's very peculiar the way that he was, you know, I am hey, doing Operation Warp Speed, but I don't really believe COVID is is that serious. And I don't know about these vaccines. And now, you know, because Ron DeSantis is anti-vaccine, Donald Trump seems to be pro-vaccine. Uh, you know, it's it, there's, you know, from the very top, there was this kind of ambivalence about what do we do uh, that I think, as you were pointing out, a lot of people, if Trump is doing it, then I'm against it, uh, vice, you know, and vice versa. So, um, I you mean, know, I, the, yeah. I mean, I completely agree with you that uh, in those months, when you watch Trump in the press conferences, you may have felt more uncertain and more nervous because he discussed it so flippantly. Uh, COVID's no big deal. Just maybe some, maybe bleach will help. I don't know, maybe bleach will help. Maybe light will help. I mean, he's right. speculating in front of national audience. Uh, and so of course that's going to be unnerving when people are seeing casualties and hospitals overwhelmed. He doesn't give you the feeling of somebody who's following all the details and, and, and you do worry that he had uh, secondary motives, which is obviously he was facing a reelection. Right. I think the combination of the most divisive president in human history, a election year and yeah. Uh, I, I think that's a recipe for disaster. But 
the reason I, I particularly put maybe more blame on Fauci is, you know, presumably he defines himself. He's the adult in the room. Yeah. And yet mm -hmm. he didn't want to have debates. I mean, look at how right. they demonized Jay and Martin. Uh, he mm -hmm. quelched opposition. He put out his own statements that DeSantis reopened schools in the spring of 2020. That was the right decision. But he opposed those. And so, I mean, I expect more from people who are the adults in the room. Yeah. And, you know, he's retired. A lot of these people have moved off the stage of public opinion. But Francis Collins, obviously, yeah. Uh, at the NIH is also a big, uh, you know, a big player in that of trying to squelch debate. Could you explain briefly why even, you know, kind of like, you know, people were liking this to a war event and, you know, you don't you don't have uh, long debates during wartime, et cetera. But one, one of your arguments is that exactly at these moments when we are most, you know, you know, struggling with what to do next and, and the future is uncertain. We are, our state of knowledge is incomplete or unclear at best. You've argued that that's exactly a time when we need to be opening up debate. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I think, we, I mean, uh, for me, it's an obvious point that when you're facing a situation you've never faced before and making decisions that are larger than have ever been made in human history and unprecedented, mm -hmm that that's an opportunity where smart people will have the most disagreement, not the least disagreement, it's the least settled. And I think what you need is, and I, I suspect maybe this applies to war too. I mean, if I had a bunch of generals around a table, I want somebody there to argue why we're not doing the right thing. So right. I can hear the counter arguments and think about it. And even if I do what I'm gonna do anyway, I do it knowing some things that I might've been blind to. Um, I think Scalia famously used to have a clerk whose only job was they disagreed with him, but they provided a balance. In science, it's so desperately necessary. I, I think that, to me, the failure of scientific debate has been the greatest failure around the pandemic. Podcasts, this this video that you're all doing, you we all did a better job than universities. I mean, Stanford, Harvard, my own institution, I can't think of a single debate we've had on visitor policies, masking in the hospital, school closure, um, masking in communities, vaccine uptake in policies. We've had zero debates. I'm in the Department of Epidemiology. Who should be debating this if not the universities? And why are universities not debating it? I think that's part of a broader trend where ideas that people disagree with are viewed as violence and not something to contend with and outwit and, and persuade. And I think that's a huge problem. Um, so you had Fauci and, uh, and Collins. They had a point of view, a policy they wanted to advance. Uh, debate would threaten to reveal their errors and they chose to quelch debate. I want to point out one more thing. They're in a unique role. They're both somebody who's a pundit on TV telling you what we should do with schools, and they're the head of the agency that gives scientists their funding. Right. Our funding is dependent on their institution. And so any scientist who may feel like they disagree has to weigh the professional repercussions that they at least believe could happen in their mind. And I think in the future, no one should hold both those jobs. If you want to be a pundit, be a pundit, but don't control the NIAID budget. Hmm. It's an unnerving situation to be in because, you know, that I, I had that same sense as all this unfolded during the pandemic. And I'm just a guy trying to figure out what to do, um, you know, for myself, for my family, communicating to other people. And you see this playing out. You see that debate being squelched. You see the messaging that is inconsistent. Uh, anyone who's paying attention, you don't have to have a medical degree to notice uh, when Fauci's saying one thing about masks and then flip-flopping and saying something else about masks. So I buy your thesis that we should not trust public health anymore. They should lose our trust. But it does seem like a really dangerous place to be because then what do you do in the void there? You know, you, you are left with the people on Twitter, the people on the podcasts. And, you know, I, I have a sense of, you know, who, who to listen to just, I, my rule of thumb is kind of like, are they consistently getting things right? Um, and, you know, trying to the best I can do, look at the numbers for, you know, my demographic, trying to age stratify the best I can on, on my own since, you know, the, the CDC is not doing it. So how do we operate in this world going forward? 
Gosh, it's unnerving. I, I think, I mean, I share your view, but if you were to imagine if there, you know, there's people talking about whether or not there's an escape of bird flu or something like that, if that were really to happen in this year, I yeah. think we'll be, it's, we'll be totally destroyed. I mean, you, you'll just see some states doing the exact opposite of other states. There'll be a uh, fierce political contention around this issue. Uh, 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 there'll be revolt from a huge chunk of the citizenry over any action. Uh, even an action that is actually the wise action for a different risk that's totally different, um, people may revolt over. I think we are so weak and vulnerable. Um, so you're, there's two parts of the question. One is how can they rebuild the trust? Trust yeah. can yeah. be lost in a moment, takes decades to reaccumulate. The second, right. the second thing is what can an individual do? Um, the second part first, what can an individual do? I mean, I used to also trust the CDC and my trust is shattered. And so what that means is every time I make a personal medical decision, I have to do a lot more homework. And so I have less and less trust in experts. And I don't like to live that way. I mean, I'd like to have some trust in institutions and experts. It makes my life harder to go decide if the bivalent booster is right for me and figure out who I can follow and not follow. And I'm somebody who's trained in evidence-based medicine. You know, um, I'm trained in this sort of stuff, but it's still work. Uh, so I lament that. And I think we all are going to have to think of ways that we can work on that. For the building trust back, yeah. I think we can talk about some structural fixes, yep. but um, it's 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 going to take decades. I mean, I think that the harms yeah. were done. It's going to take decades. Uh, most of my fixes are, you know, the CDC, look at their roles. Their job is to keep track of the death statistics and also to tell you what you ought to do. We need separate groups. I mean, the people keeping track of the statistics, just keep track of statistics and report statistics on a website that any American can download. Mm -hmm. They made mistakes in their statistics. You know, they were incorrect about the number of kids who were dead and they had to provide a revision. And of course, their their errors always go in the direction of their policy. And so an observer might say, this is not a random error. This looks like bias, like you're right. lying to me to get me to do what you want me to do. And the only way to do that is to build a firewall. So the people who try to advise you are different than those keeping the statistics. Yeah. And I think there needs to be a third group, which is the group that sets out to evaluate the policies. And they should be separate from the group that institutes the policies. The CDC says schools should wear masks. And by the way, our new study that we published in our own journal says that that was a good idea. I mean, mm -hmm. what am I to think? I mean, you yeah. said to do it. You yeah. did the study and you put it in your own journal and it has tons of flaws. Um, we need separate checks and balances in public health, just like we do have in government. But it's right. also, I, I mean, I think what you're saying is something that a lot of people miss too, is that it is going to take decades, but it's structural and systemic. Uh, it, if it wasn't Fauci, if it wasn't Francis Collins, you know, it, it's likely we would have still had similar mistakes made because when you have centralized control and centralized power and centralized knowledge, you know, the, the possibility of, cog, you know, of, of bias and of, you know, just, you know, bad decision making uh, being really negative, the, the consequences of that are much more likely. I totally agree. I mean, as much as I do blame them and I, I do blame them at a personal yeah. level, and I do think some of them should be fired. Um, and I've written that. For but sure. I, but, but I think you're right, that it is a structural problem and you could have replaced them with other actors who would have made similar, if not worse or different. We've replaced, yeah, we've, I mean, we've replaced one president with another and error continues. So Correct. it's, you know, meet the old boss or the, meet the new boss the same as the old boss. I mean, part, part of my impression was that one of the saving graces here in the United States was the fact that we do have this federalist system where different <laughs> states could try different approaches. So... We had Ron DeSantis here in Florida trying something else um, radically different than what California, California, where I was living at the time, was doing um, and was in contradiction to the, the CDC guidance. Um, and with the vaccine question, I, I don't think DeSantis is necessarily anti-vaccine, but he's the Florida is certainly taking a different approach in, in terms of what it, the, its state level agency is recommending for different ages in terms of the vaccine. And so I just wonder if that, given the current state of the CDC and the FDA, if that is part of the answer is continuing to devolve power down from them, just make them less powerful, give them less authority to impose mandates, you know, uh, issuing guidance or, you know, keeping track of statistics is one thing, but, you know, imposing any sort of either mandates or, or gatekeeping is where we really seem to run into problems, uh, especially once you get up to the federal level where you're talking about 330 million people. That's 
a superb point. Um, and I just, I, I mean, I totally agree with you that if you want to strip them of powers, I will support that. And I was the opposite view maybe five years ago. Right. But I just want to point out one way that kind of backfired was the school reopening because mm -hmm. Biden came into office and he said he wanted to reopen schools within 100 days uh, and not even high schools. And he had difficulty because a lot of local, typically left of center jurisdictions decided that they want to keep them closed for the rest of this, the year, despite the fact teachers were getting the vaccines first. And so decentralized authority um, can lead to innovation because I think Florida did more things right than California, but it can also lead to uh, chaos uh, because I think San Francisco schools is an unmitigated disaster. Yeah. Um, uh, but your point is well taken <laughs> that I think, I mean, the core question this is why humanity is damned, right? <laughs> you know, we either have too much power or too little power. Nobody, nobody follows what I want. Well, you know, it's, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a trade-off because, yeah. uh, you, you kind of, you, and, and you don't always, that, that's the whole point of, of that kind of more fractured system is right. yes. when, when you don't have, uh, kind of the, the best and brightest or the most honest yeah. at the top, the best you can hope for is that somebody at the bottom is going to figure it out and you can see, you know, in real time that it's, it's, you know, Florida, it's sort of working out. San Francisco, not so much. And I more think more this is a good time when I, to point out that Zach is smarter than you because he left California and <laughs> moved to Florida, partly for many reasons. But yeah. one of them was, uh, I mean, it you know, certainly COVID. played, it certainly played yeah. a factor. Yes, it certainly. He is yeah. smarter than me. Uh, some of us don't have the, the luxury. Can but I, want one thing. I just want to yeah. say about this topic. I mean, I think we need to separate the role of scientists from the role of uh, politics. Yeah. You know, scientists can articulate what the trade-offs are and maybe do a good job of that, but we saw scientists routinely overstep their role right. and also make policy choices, which inherently require values and input of the public. Only the public can decide, I think, if lockdowns are worth it or if hospital visit policies are worth it. Uh, it's not a scientific question, but we saw over and over the public was steamrolled, uh, and I think that's a great problem. And, uh, you know, to take it back to specifically people who are identify themselves and are public health authorities, you know, one day they would be saying that, you know, if 10 people got together to complain about vaccine mandates, that's a super spreader event. They should be arrested. The next day, 10,000 people might get together to protest uh, George Floyd's killing, you know, which I think is eminently worth, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, demonstrating against, but then they would be like, no, no, that's not a super spreader event because it's all about costs and benefits or whatever. Um, that is, you know, public health as a concept has really taken it on the chin rightly because of the way that public health authorities and spokespeople talk during COVID. Can we push a little bit more on the FDA sure. issue? Um, should, do you think ideally, and this is an old libertarian, uh, you know, kind of rocking horse, you know, should the FDA have a monopoly on what kinds of drugs or uh, medical devices or or practices are um, are authorized and made legal in the United States, or should they be, at best, um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, recommenders, or should they be one, uh, you know, for medical devices in Europe, there are a number of different agencies that can recommend that a device is safe and, and can be brought to market. What What is your sense of how far should we devolve power away from a one-size-fits-all decision-making process at, you know, at the federal level? I think there's there's two legitimate things you could argue here. One, there can be a group of people who have more libertarian bent who argue that the FDA's role should be maybe to put a stamp on something, to rate it on a scale. But yeah, this is the good housekeeping model right. or the underwriter's laboratory model of, of authorizing something. Of authorizing something and largely let the public doctors in concert with the people they trust make sort of healthcare choices. And to some, in some ways, we've moved towards that model because we have a right to try legislation and, and there's some advances in that space. So that's one worldview. I think there's another worldview where people who uh, believe more in the power of regulation should say something like, well, like the FDA is basically trying to prevent sick, desperate people from making choices that could harm them. And so they need to really make sure that these products actually work and that the benefits mm -hmm. outweigh the risks. And, uh, and if and only if they meet that criteria, should they be allowed to be sold on the U.S. market? That's the regulator way. And then let's just talk about where we are. We're in a middle ground that neither party is happy because I, the regulator side is not happy because the products coming to the market, there's no assurance you'll live longer or live better. Many okay. products actually will be found later to have serious safety concerns or withdrawn from the market because they didn't enforce an efficacy requirement. The booster in a 12-year-old might turn out to be a 
huge miscalculation and they were wrong. So they advised you to do something with the imprimatur of the agency that turned out not to be correct. In the meantime, they do stifle innovation because they're setting all these hurdles that keep small biotech firms off the market. So neither do they protect the public, nor do they allow for you know, the power of the market. They're the worst of both worlds. They're sort of a world of, uh, of, of crony capitalism, and then they later go work for the company. So I think, I mean, your argument is well taken. No matter where you are on this philosophical spectrum, I think the place they've decided to pitch their tent is indefensible. There was a, uh, well, where I, are you though? Are you, do you lean more towards the market or more towards the regulatory model? I always say that I, you know, people don't believe me, but I always say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a progressive on these issues. So I, I lean more to the regulatory issue and I've written two books on how it could yeah. be done. But I mean, over the years, I mean, I guess disappointment after disappointment makes you worry that they won't be able to get their act together, even in a perfect world. And so, so, you know, sometimes I struggle I mean, it it is, and I recommend that people go look at your uh, at your books because I mean, a, a huge part of your uh, kind of intellectual work, your project, is how does medicine, how does medical practice get better? Right. Because bad interventions hang around like right. basically as long or longer than good ones. So it's like, okay, how do we how do we change this? That's that's a really difficult question, and it's one that I think a lot of the times we just take for granted because you know, we're living longer for the most part. And, and, you know, we seem to be getting it right, but eh, you know, there's a lot of mistakes. And an issue that I saw some of the FDA regulators or advisors struggling with, uh, as this was playing out, uh, I was, I watched some of the meetings about whether or not to approve the vaccines for the youngest age group, you know, six and under or six to 12, I, I think might've been the, the cohort. Um, and there were people that wanted to vote yes, but they were expressing, I want to vote yes, but I don't want this to mean that the schools are all going to mandate the vaccine. And then of course, that's exactly what happened. There was this pipeline of the FDA gives the emergency use authorization, the CDC then recommends it, and then the local school districts or even the city of San Francisco say, then you have the, to give your kid the vaccine to get into school, or if you're in the city of San Francisco, you have to show proof that they're vaccinated to go to a public venue. How, is, is there a way to break that chain of events? Because to me, that is that seems like, the biggest problem that I that I saw occurring over and over again of going from we're going to give people access to this thing to require them to get it. Yeah, I mean, I think that was a catastrophic problem. Uh, thankfully, a lot of the districts that did mandate it have backed away from it when they saw what it's going to do to schools, which is it's yeah. going to lead to the expulsion of tens of thousands of children, predominantly uh, black and Hispanic or disproportionately black and Hispanic and poor. Uh, and so they, they finally came to their senses on the 11th hour. Um, but in my mind, uh, that's an example of something that the evidence was so weak, I felt, and then the, and the risk in that age group was so low, I felt like you couldn't in good conscience actually say there's an EUA authority that to be used. I mean, you need more data to really even know. And uh, as a provider, I think, you would have, gen you know, how will you really counsel a six-year-old who just had COVID a month ago, who can look that family in the eye and say, I know what's right for you. I, and nobody knows the answer. Mm -hmm. um, so they could sort of abdicate their duty because, you know, no one else can make them generate evidence. But your point is well taken that there can be caveats expressed, but the moment they cast that uh, authorization, it's going to lead to mandates instantly. And I think the only checks and balances I can see in the system would be one, I think we do have to remove some of the indemnification because if school districts were able to be sued if a 16-year-old athlete who had COVID got the booster that they were mandated to and then had myocarditis, I think they would have a lot of pause and they would be much less likely to mandate um, products under the auspices of EUA. I think you might be able to say that nothing under the auspices of EUA should be mandated by anybody. Maybe that needs to be able to be a rule. But I do think we get into a problem when, I mean, I know people write to me, uh, their kids are going to a summer camp in upstate New York, and they have mandates beyond what even the CDC recommends. So who is making these decisions? Uh, uh, that's a dangerous place. You have written um, multiple times over the past couple of years about, you know, what what the the experience with the pandemic and with lockdowns and with EUAs and whatnot, um, you know, how that is it it is setting the stage or you you look forward to a future where a lot of democratic norms and a lot of personal liberty, uh, economic liberty, you name it, ends. 
How are you feeling about the kind of health of the body politic? Has the, you know, has, has the COVID experience kind of weakened us so that we're going to be more sheepish in the future or has it kind of kicked in a, a set of kind of cultural antibodies? You were talking earlier uh, with us about how, you know, now people are as likely as not to say, screw you to whatever the government says. Where are you on this, this kind of concern right now? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm very worried about what's outlined in that piece. And, um, you know, just think about it. Uh, I, I, we still take our shoes off in the airports. I mean, I don't know if that has done anything or has any net expected value versus the thousands of hours that it must has caused an enormous amount of personal embarrassment. But uh, yeah, beyond that, beyond that, time, sure that it's I mean, accomplished much more than that. I mean, yeah, that I'm is not... a good thing for the country to be doing. But yeah, but we still do it. Um, yeah. so, so what's the argument in that piece? The argument is that we have a situation where who decides that their emergency powers end? It's the governor. Yeah. It's the president. The president has announced that this emergency will end in, in May. Um, if you have a situation where an elected official decides when they get to have massive powers and they decide what the emergency is and the media can shape our impression of the emergency, perhaps with misleading statistics or misleading anecdotes, um, how might that be misused? I think the potential for misuse uh, is tremendous. That that piece outlines a hypothetical scenario. I hope it never happens. That you know the governor of a small state around an election says, "Hey, the hospitals are filling up with cases, and we have to declare, uh, you know, we're going to see, we're going to stop uh, motor vehicles because you know we can't just have extra car accidents in the hospital. We don't have the space uh, or other restrictions they could place. Restrictions that could happen around voting or election cycles. I think." We have underestimated uh, the threat of these powers to be used by an unscrupulous actor. Right. And I think no matter where anyone sits on the political spectrum, you can all imagine somebody you don't want to have the power to declare unlimited emergency powers. Um, and I think we should be more cognizant of that. Yeah. I mean, but do you think, you know, coming out of this uh, and I guess, you know, it's legitimate to say we're coming out of it, you know, at, at various points, Joe Biden has declared that COVID is over, various states have, et cetera. But do you feel um, do you feel like we're a little bit stronger, like we're a little bit more cognizant of these threats? Or do you feel like, no, this was actually kind of setting us up to be even more complacent going future or more docile if something, you know, and maybe it's maybe it's not a pandemic. Maybe it's an uh, you know an economic uh, catastrophe or something like that. But you know, how do you, how do you feel? Do you think we're we're in a better position to stave that off, or we're you know we're more likely to flow with whatever the government says? I, I hope we're in a better position to stave it off. But I guess my bias is that I'm surrounded in pockets of people who still believe. Yeah. A lot of the things that are wrong. I mean, I still go to a workplace where maybe 15% of people are masking all the time. Some yeah. I went to the gym uh, and people are wearing cloth masks while working out. I saw somebody wearing an N95 in a sauna. Uh, I see people who are, you know, chiding others for You're not getting boosted. To sound like Rucker Hauer at the end of Blade Runner. You know, it's like the <laughs> yeah. things you've seen, nobody, no human should see. Um, does this square, like when you, you said that, you know, at least in terms of drug, uh, regulation, you lean a little bit more towards the progressive end of things, or uh, do you have a personal politics and, um, you know, how, how does that factor into your kind of framework and approach to these types of topics? Well, I'm a lifelong Democrat. I'm a Bernie Sanders supporter. And so to see my side get yeah. these issues steadily incorrect has been catastrophic. I mean, we yeah. got... We're, we're the side that's supposed to say we care about poor, disadvantaged minority children. We did the single greatest discriminatory action in quarter century, which was close their schools for 18 months. And guess what? They all got COVID anyway. And guess and most of them got COVID before they got vaccines because uptake is so poor in that age group because the data is so weak. And so what have we done? We're the group that says we're, you know, we believe in scientific principles. The same people who say that are critical of the Cochrane report on masking because it didn't yield the conclusion they want. And so I guess COVID-19 has been a profound disappointment uh, that my side has any moral or scientific uh, superiority over any other side. And, uh, and, and now I'm, I'm, I'm without a party. <laughs> To, to Vinay's uh, earlier point. We, about... we have a magazine that you might want to subscribe to. <laughs> we have a newsletter. Yeah. Uh, to to, to the, the earlier point about uh, states of emergency uh, just persisting endlessly. This is uh, from February 28th, 2023. 
So yesterday, California <laughs> just ended. That's uh, governor. I should I should uh, be more specific. Gavin Newsom ended the state of emergency because that's the situation we're in. Is that one person has the ability to do that with no democratic check on their powers? And and I I agree with with you that this is a looming threat coming out of this that needs to be taken seriously. And I, I hope there's more. Um, kind of focus and, and you know, effort, at, especially at the state and local level, right. since that's where these things seem to drag on and on again. Like, what? why should a state of emergency be able to just uh, endlessly persist until the person who declared it says it's over? It seems like there should be, you know, a regular check-in maybe from the legislature to say, okay, are we really still all on the same page here? I mean, I, I know that the California legislature has the power to do that, but mm. it's almost got to be like baked into the state of emergency itself or, or else I, I'm afraid that we, we really are going to fall into that sort of trap whenever the next catastrophe hits. Absolutely right. No, I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah. And that's a place where the kind of structural reform where, you know, every state of emergency, no matter what, has a sunset clause, you know, whether it's, you know, two weeks or 30 days or 90 days or that it has to be renewed. Um, God, you have to do that when you lock people up, you know, on, right. on um, uh, psychiatric holds in California. You right. know, you got to you got to drag them in front of a court at least to to keep them after a certain point. And the principle uh, there is when you deprive people of liberty, there must be yeah. some check on your ability to deprive them of liberty. And what we did in the pandemic was, in many ways, we deprived people of liberty and some core human liberties, the liberty to go and visit your child when they get chemotherapy and have both parents be there. We deprived them of that liberty. Uh, we deprived them of liberty to go to shops and restaurants and go out. Uh, uh, and there has to be checks on those, those sorts yep. of deprivations, yeah. Kid, I guess uh, we should uh, wrap up, but uh, Vinay, what, you know, obviously you're doing this in your work, but, you know, give a quick spiel on how do we remember the past? Not so that we endlessly replicate it, but so that we learn from it and actually, you know, take the best parts of the path and add it to new knowledge so that moving forward, we're not stuck in a loop where we're just endlessly replicating the worst aspects of, of recent trauma. I wish I had the answer to that. Uh, you know, he who forgets history is condemned to repeat it, the Santayana quote. Um, you know, I'm trying to do my small part, which is we do research and we want to do research on these issues that better clarify which of these things helped, how much they helped and what we lost in the process, what worked, what didn't, uh, what were the errors made, who made them and when. And we're going to work on putting that in the peer review literature. It's a small part, but that's a literature that's enduring. Hopefully will be cited and hopefully we persuade people. And I think we have persuaded a lot of people because I think more and more people start to see things the way that the three of us see things and many others who follow you all. Um, but there's still people out there who live on a bubble. They may think that school closure was wise or that if anything, we didn't mask hard enough or the real source of misinformation is Joe Rogan rather than the CDC director. I think that the CDC director and Fauci did more for public trust and health than Joe Rogan could do in a thousand lifetimes. I mean, it's not even close. And so that's a battle of the ideas that still has to be won. Um, and until you win that battle, I think it's gonna be difficult for people to acknowledge the mistakes they made. But then the last thing I'll leave you with is, I mean, I remember when we went into Iraq and Afghanistan, and I remember there were just a few voices uh, who said that that might be misguided. And I also remember just, uh, you know, uh, within the decade, um, it was such a hot issue that if you had cast a vote for that war, you couldn't be a presidential nominee. Uh, and you ended up losing, you know, that's Hillary lost to uh, Barack Obama. And so I do think most of our COVID response will age in that way, that the pendulum will swing greatly. And there are a lot of people who stayed on the sidelines um, who do agree. And I think they're going to come out of the woodwork. And I think we will see a big, uh, big change. Well, thank you. That's a, uh, a kind of haunting, but also powerful note to end on. Vinay Prasad, thanks for talking to Zach Weismuller and myself of Reason. Thanks for having me.